to me, light of the world. Just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. Bring it more than a song, church. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within Through the way things 
Just to feel your arms around me, just to know your grace has found me, just to hear your voice around me, calling my name. Can we sing that? Just to feel your arms. Just to feel your arms around me, just to know your grace has found me, just to
just to know your grace has found me. Oh, we stand, Lord God, in your presence. We stand, holy God, in your presence. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How awesome to be in your presence, oh God. How wonderful to be in your house, Lord, to be surrounded by your glory, to know that we can come into your presence this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just maintain this, this atmosphere, this attitude of worship. You may just close your eyes for just a few moments. And um, let's not lose this sense of God speaking to us this morning. And uh, Christiane has a word that, that is um, from the Lord. This morning I was standing in the front row and I'm holding my son and I'm listening to the song, but I'm not really there. And my daughter took my child away to church. And as soon as I closed my eyes, God showed me something. I mean, instantly, I didn't have to work myself up. He was right there, ready to talk to me. And he said, the world is very confusing right now. And everybody's eyesight is on everything and on nothing really because it's like a bunch of flashlights going off in the woods. You can't really see anything until everybody focuses their beam in one area. And then that thing is completely lit up and everybody understands it. And he says, focus on me. Don't look around you. Just focus on me. The things in the corners that are dark, they're not your problem. That's not your business. You look at me and let me take care of that. And if anybody needed that word today, you take it with you. All that stuff going on, it's not important. Just put your eyes, put your focus on God, and let him take care of all the rest of it. Amen. Boy, that's, that's so good. That's so true, isn't it? Well, what is it this morning that, that you're carrying that, that is keeping your focus from, from our Heavenly Father? What is it that, that uh, perhaps is distracting you, maybe something around you, maybe something inside of you? What is it that you need to lay down this morning? so that all of your focus, all your attention can go back to him. Lord Jesus, this morning we're, we're here standing before you as a people that are broken. All, all, our, all our righteousness is like filthy rags. We're distracted so often by things. Our eyes get easily off of you, and we turn ways that we shouldn't turn. And, and Lord, but we're reminded this morning that when we put our eyes on you, that everything else falls into place. And so, Lord, we just lay down right now uh, all those cares, all those concerns, all those things that would come to the forefront, that would, would seek to distract us from you. Whatever that is this morning, church, just, just begin to lay it down. You might just whisper to him, Lord, I give you my care. I give you that concern. I give you, Lord, my fear and my worry about the future. I give you, Lord, th those things that keep you know that they're simply distractions from your throne. Lord, take them, we leave them at your cross this morning. We choose to leave them in this place today at your feet, at your altar, God, because we believe that you are big enough to take care of all of them. And Lord, draw us to you. Open our eyes to see you in a new and fresh way, that, Lord, we might be full of who you are. Pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, amen, amen, awesome. Hey, before you're seated this morning, would you just turn and uh, greet one another and uh, shake their hand, introduce yourself, maybe give them a hug. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, worship team. Well, good morning. If you would just grab your bulletin, just want to uh, talk you through a couple of things. There's uh, some inserts I want to draw your attention to. And before I do that, I just want to welcome any guests that we might have here this morning. Maybe you're with us for the first time today. We would love to connect with you. Uh, in the backs of the chairs in front of you, there's not necessarily every chair, maybe every third chair, there are some of these large white cards with the kind of the green swoops on them. 
Uh, it says connection card. If you wouldn't mind just grabbing one of those and filling it out and taking it after the service to the guest services counter in the lobby. They have a gift. Uh, they'll give to you just our way of saying welcome. We love it that you're here with us. You're not signing up for our mailing list unless you check that. We just love to know that you're here with us and love it when new people are, are worshiping with us. I uh, want to draw your attention to a number of Easter announcements. And so you ever got your bulletin out here? Wave it at me for just a second. Uh, Easter is our biggest uh, service of the year. It's the biggest service of just about anybody's, uh, any church uh, of the year. And it's because all the Christers come out on, on Easter, right? All the Christmas and Easter people that come once a year, they come on Easter. And we'd love to have them because when they come in the door, they can really encounter our Heavenly Father and have a have a, a revelation of who he is and suddenly and they turn from Christers into uh, regular attenders falling in love with Jesus and so we're so excited Easter is around the corners two weeks away uh, but it's because it is the largest service of the year it's also a lot of work and a lot of activity and one of the ministries that's greatly impacted by that is our children's ministry uh, they have I think it's something like 300 kids plus uh, that they uh, have to put on programs for that weekend. And so if you've been around for a while, you know we put tents up outside uh, because there's so many kids we don't have anywhere to put them other than create a tent for them, and they have crafts and activities, just a really phenomenal program. But because of all of the additional people, they also need uh, additional help. And uh, maybe you would like to help in children's ministry, but not every week. Maybe you just like to do it once in a while, and so this is a great opportunity to do that, or maybe you kind of, you know, haven't found your place in terms of ministry. This is a great time just to try something out. This is a sort of a once, uh, one-time opportunity uh, to help in children's ministry on Easter Sunday. Uh, it's a great way that you can um, help minister to the community, and you can all, always do it one service and then uh, be with your family another service. So if you just look in your bulletin there, the tan tear off that's normally a connection card says help out in children's ministry this Easter and uh, and and if you would if you're interested if you would help us we need um, I think about 40 additional volunteers that would help us you can uh, you can indicate you know I'll, I'll be there 9 9 a.m. service the 11 a.m. service both the services uh, or I'll help with tear down so if you would uh, consider that we would very much appreciate it so one of those great ways that we can team together and minister to the to the Kings County. Just fill that out right now. In a little while, we'll take the offering, and you can drop it in the bucket. And then they'll contact you with uh, additional information, get you plugged into the right spot. And, uh, and Sylvia will be thrilled uh, because there are lots and lots and lots of kids, and uh, it's just so exciting to, uh, to have them coming in. Also in your bulletin is this Easter invite card. We've been putting these in for the last couple of weeks. And these are to use, uh, not just as reminders for you, uh, but to invite your friends. Uh, Easter is, of course, one of the primary opportunities, primary times when people will come to a service. Uh, All the studies continue to show uh, if you simply invite people, uh, three out of four will come. Uh, and join you at the service. And so use this card just as a tool to say, hey, do you have Easter plans this weekend? Are you going to church? you ever considered doing that? Do you, are you taking your family somewhere? There's great children's programs, all those types of stuff, and just pass on the card. doesn't have to be a hard sell. You don't have to get in the, you know, sign on the dotted line. Uh, you know, you're not signing them up for the rest of their life. You're just saying, hey, would you consider if you don't have other plans? And so use these cards as that, uh, as that tool uh, to invite people to join us. Uh, and, of course, as you note there, on Easter week, we have uh, th- three services on the weekend, 6 o'clock on Saturday night, and then our normal Sunday morning times, 9 and 11. And then we have a good Friday service, of course, just the Friday before at 7 p.m. here. Just be about an hour, probably a little bit less than an hour. We'll do communion together. It'll be a wonderful, sweet uh, time. Uh, good Friday is always just a, a lovely time. So lovely, that's nice. Uh, so would you join us uh, if you're interested in that? And then lastly, a time to fast. You'll notice this insert. And uh, Pastor Tim last week invited the church to be a part of a fast leading up to Easter. So, so at that point it was a 21-day fast, but now it's a 14-day fast because we've got about 14 days left. And we just want to encourage you to, to join us in this time uh, of fasting uh, and prayer for the Easter season. Uh, there's information in this about what a fast is. Maybe you've never fasted before. Maybe you don't really understand the biblical underpinnings of that and what that means. And so this will give you some of those basics of what a fast is, how to do it. 
gives you some specifics on how to do a Daniel fast, which is a specific type of fast. Uh, but we would love to encourage you for these next 14 days leading up to Easter Sunday that you would join with us and somehow uh, every day, if you can, uh, just uh, maybe give up a meal, maybe change your diet a little bit uh, and spend that time focusing on God, asking for his grace on Easter services, asking him to, to open people's eyes, that those creatures would, would not just come out of tradition, but when they, maybe they do come out of tradition, but when they come that they would really encounter a living Savior and just pray that uh, salvations would happen, healing would happen. On the back, there's just some prayer points. Uh, you know, maybe you have a medical condition, uh, and so you can't fast. Uh, you can, you know, certainly you want to consult your physician. We're not doctors. We don't know if you take, you know, medication, uh, whether or not you can do a particular type of fast. But you want to talk to your, phys- uh, your doctor if that's the case and you'd like to do something. But really we're talking about restricting ourselves for the purpose of prayer and asking God for his hand on Easter. So if you would consider doing that, we would love to unite with you in that. Oh, one more Easter thing. On the back there also of your bulletin, you'll notice that uh, that white piece says Easter food drive. And we're encouraging you to, uh, to bring groceries for the pantry on Easter Sunday morning. And so we would love it if everyone in Koinonia, all the families of Koinonia would come and bring hundreds and hundreds of pounds of groceries uh, to supply the King's Pantry, which gives out to hundreds of families every month groceries and just be a great witness to the community that we're supporting them and so you just tear that off take it to the grocery store if you'd like and then plan on bringing those groceries in on Easter one last thing it's also kind of Easter related and that is if you've got teens junior hires or high schoolers uh, on Easter week the week before Easter there's a special activities or a series of special activities planned for them all week long there's information in your bulletin there's a a minor cost involved because they're going to a concert they're going to feed them lunch every day but they're going to be doing a series of service projects cleaning up the BMX park and removing graffiti and doing a number of other service items uh, in and through hand and so uh, that's a great way to get your kids out of the house Easter week. They don't have school. Uh, you don't really want them around. So get them into uh, the youth ministry with Paul. Uh, I know you want them around, but uh, that's a great way to keep them busy and not have them on the Xbox all day long. So you can sign up for that at guest services and get them plugged into that. All right, if the ushers would come forward, we'll receive our offering. So if you filled out that, uh, that children's ministry insert, uh, that would be wonderful. Just drop it in. Uh, or if you've brought tithes and offerings, uh, you can drop it in this time. Let's uh, just say a quick word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much uh, for your love for us. We thank you, God, that, uh, that, that you rose and Easter is coming up and we're celebrating your life, your resurrection, that you conquered death once and for all, that we might have life forever. Not life just in the future, but life abundant right now. And so, God, we pray that people who come on Easter would encounter a living God, that your presence would be known, that many would come to know you, that there would be a transformation of their hearts and their minds, their eyes would be opened. I pray, Lord, that families uh, who don't go to church would come to church uh, throughout this, this county, Lord, all over. There are churches that are preparing. I just pray, Lord, that you'd rain down your grace in your life uh, in two weeks on Easter, as, each, as you do every week. But, Lord, just do a visitation that's special for us. Lord, for this offering, we pray that you'd bless it. Every household that gives, my God, I pray that you would increase and supply them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Pastor amen, Tim. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Andrew. Turn with me to Matthew's chapter 16. We'll tear into the word this morning. If you don't have a Bible, uh, 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 maybe in a few moments the ushers can't do two or three things at one time. I have a tough time walking and breathing so uh, uh, and talking at the same time. So I, it's just impossible for them to, to pass out Bibles. But in a few moments they'll be coming back down. And if you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand and they'll give one to you. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 26, and I want to talk to you about the death of Christ for these next two weeks and the resurrection of Christ uh, on Easter. No matter how thin the pancake, there's always two sides. Whenever you talk with a married couple, there's always two sides of the issue. (laughs) Whenever you face Temptation is always two ways to go. You can run to God or you can run away from God. And when you talk about the resurrection, you can't talk about the resurrection without talking about the death. And you don't want to only talk about the death. 
without talking about the resurrection, they go hand in hand. I started my 21-day fast uh, last week, as many of you did. Uh, we made 300 copies of uh, uh, fasting information and left them at the, the uh, guest services. And uh, There's only about 50 left, so about 250 people, I under, I, I, I'm assuming, are participating and encourage all of you to do, do this. I started my 21-day fast last week because that's when the Holy Spirit triggered in my heart that I was supposed to do that. And so I encouraged you to do that. I said, what do you want me to do, Lord? And for me, this will not be the same for you possibly, but for me, I gave up two meals a day and I'm only eating one meal uh, per day. On those two meals that I am fasting, I'm not just giving up food, but I'm actually seeking God. I'm uh, taking time to feast on his word, taking time to, uh, to, to uh, be a vehicle that God can release uh, his spirit to do what he wants to do in this season. I've been praying. I says, oh, God, uh, kind of like from Ephesians 3, you remember that prayer? God, show me the depth. Show me the, the width. Show me the length. Show me the height of your love for me. I'll open up the, my understanding to what it cost you on the cross. Show me the pain that you went through all for me. Do you know that the cross is the greatest statement of God's love for you? It's not his life. Thank you for his life among us. But it was his death that's the ultimate statement of his love for you. When you will lay down your love for your life for someone, when you will die for them and you actually do it, it's a tremendous statement of love. You give up your life for them. I prayed, oh God, make me aware of, of, uh, of, of the, the sin that, that I've done that caused you to make a decision and, and, and fulfill the plan of God to redeem me by going to the cross. Make me aware of that. Give me a refreshed sensitivity to, to your death. Death's not a, a, a pleasant subject, is it? In the text that we're going to look at, we're going to look at a man by the name of Peter and how he vehemently, is that how to pronounce that? Violently reacted to the news that Jesus was going to die. And we all have a reaction to death when it comes our way. Death isn't something we like to talk about. I just wrote an article for the uh, 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 Sentinel that will come out next Saturday. It's entitled The Divine per, uh, Perspective. And we don't like to talk about death because we see it from a human perspective. My wife, whenever I talk about, well, my dad died at 58, my brother died at 54, my mother died at 51, my whole family. I mean, my, my wife says, be quiet, don't talk about that stuff. Uh, when I say that with, with Christians, it's like they jump up and say, well, you don't have to claim that. You, you, can go, you can live to 80. And I know that. I understand that. But just the very fact of talking about death, kind of, it, it just, it's not a subject we, we like to talk about. And so we, we, we tend to avoid it. But I believe that as we today and next week take a, a full frontal f uh, look at uh, the death of Christ, that he may trigger something in us and cause something to happen. So if, having said that, turn with me to Matthew 16, if you aren't there already, and let me read to you uh, uh, what takes place. Uh, he is in a uh, place called Caesarea of Philippi, and I was there 15 years ago. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's not one of those places you visit and they have some shrine reminding you of where Jesus might have been, but this was the actual place. It's a huge rock. It's like a mountain that just stands before you. If you've ever been there, you can understand why he, when he talks to Peter, he says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. It was just, it's just obvious that, that, that this huge rock is there. So he's talking to Peter, and he's having this discussion with not only Peter, but his disciples. And, he's, and it's a place called Caesarea of Philippi. And we pick up the story in verse 21 chapter 16 of Matthew, and it says, From this time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law. Those were the three ruling parties in the Sanhedrin at that time. And, they, and that he must be killed, on, and on the third day he would be raised to life. Peter, hearing that, verse 22, took him aside and he began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. You know you're entering into the area of reacting rather than responding when you use terms like never. You always, you never, you know, when you start talking like that, you are not responding to something. You cross the line and you're reacting to things. He says, You'll never, this will never happen to you. 
Jesus turns to him in verse 23 and says, Get behind me, Satan. Pretty strong response to what Peter said. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And so after that encounter, he turns to his disciples, verse 24, and he says, if anyone would come after me, and this is, this is actually the practical application of this text. He goes on to say, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Actually, go where I go. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but, he, but whoever loses his life will find it. For when Whoever loses his life for me will find it. Verse 26, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet he forfeits his soul? What we pick up here in the very first verse, verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer, and ultimately die. We picked up uh, the reality of the situation, and if you're taking notes, you can get them out now. If you're not, that's okay. But we we learned that he knew that he was going to die. Now, in your notes, the first thing I want to say to you, the reality of of everything is everybody is going to die. Would you turn to someone right now, if you're close enough to someone, and just say the word everybody includes you and me. Would you just turn to someone and, and, and say that? And so Jesus knew that he was going to die. Now, everyone in this room is going to die but at some point, but all of us don't necessarily know when. Jesus knew when. Now, this was the beginning point where he clearly said to his disciples, and they knew pretty much that, that he was going to die. I remember when my dad told me that my mom was going to die. She was involved, but she wasn't able to really communicate because of uh, her emotional place. We were sitting down at, at, at home, and we had gone through. I knew she had been in the hospital. She had gone back for a lot of visits. And so we had kind of assumed, I'm sure the disciples were aware that there was something pending because Jesus for a long time had been talking about a cup and, and a time, uh, his time and something to do with suffering. But, but it wasn't until now that he was plainly talking to them about his death. And for months, we went with my mother to the hospital and did all of these things. But there came a time when we knew she was going to die. Everybody doesn't know that. If, if, if we did know that, we were going to die in a month. And see, Jesus was just approximately a month away from, from dying. That's why I titled this, this, this two-week series, A Month to Live. As, as I read this, and he was telling the disciples, I thought, if I knew that I had one month to live, what changes would I make? Would I make any changes at all? Everybody doesn't know that they're going to die. John F. Kennedy Jr., do you think that he and his, was it his uh, wife-to-be at that time, and others, do, do you think that they would have gotten into that plane had they known that they were going to die that day? Do you think that the people who died in 9-11, do you think that they would have gone to work that day? Wouldn't have they stayed home if they had known? If we, had, if we are told, if you go to the doctors and he tells you, you have one month to live, what is going to happen inside of you? When you share that with other people, what are they going to do? How would you react to news like that? That was the question that kind of went through my mind when I read this. He knew he was going to die. The challenge for you and me and the interesting thing is that Jesus knew he was going to die, but he didn't change one thing. In your notes, point two, the real challenge for you and me is to live every day as if it's the last day. Jesus was already walking in God's will. After that point, he healed a man. He did some teaching. He had to even deal with some staff problems, some disciple problems. They were arguing with one another about who's who's greatest. Jesus tells them he's going to die, and, and, and the disciples look and says, Well, Jesus, can I sit at your right hand? John, can I sit at your left hand? It's kind of like I sit my boys down. I, I say, Eric and Brad, uh, Mom and I, we have some bad news to tell you. Your dad's going to die in a while. Hey, hey, can I have the car? Hey, can I get, can, who, who's going to get the house? You know, that's kind of what it was. Hey, I, I'm going to die in, a, in just a little while, and you're talking about that. That's what Jesus had to face in this month-long period. He knew he was going to die. Peter knew he was going to die. If you read 2 Peter chapter 1, he, he says, I remind you of these things, and it's not, I, I, it doesn't bother me to remind you. I don't want you to forget, because my death is imminent. 
It says the Christ, Christ has revealed to me, and the word eminent is very shortly, I'm going to lose my life. I'm going to die. There are people who are aware of their death. There are people who aren't aware of their death. And when it's shared, there was a reaction by Peter. But isn't there a reaction that all of us have to news like that? Isn't there a reaction that uh, takes place? Sometimes it may be uh, very, uh, very demonstrative like Peter. It says that he actually took Jesus aside and rebuked him very strong term, started to use terminology. This will never, it's not like, Jesus, come here. Hey, no, this is not going to happen to you. This will never take place. No, the whole language there is, he took him aside, and it, the, the, the emotions were high, the voice elevated. If you've ever been in an argument with people, you can kind of watch it. It starts out kind of conversationally, but all of a sudden you're talking like this. And Jesus, and Jesus was taken aside by Peter, and his voice began to lift. His emotions were involved. He says, this is never going to happen to you, Jesus. We'll stand by you. We'll make sure this doesn't take place. Tremendous reaction. I've discovered that, uh, uh, or I've noticed, I should say, that the more distant the relationship, the less the reaction when the news of death comes. Have you noticed that to be true? If you read in the newspaper... Uh, well, you can pick up any day, any newspaper, and find out that 10 people were killed in a landslide in Los Angeles. And you read that, and you, you may stop, and for some, you may stop and pray and actually feel the pain, but for most, it's like, oh, wow, that's too bad, and then move on to the next section. There's not a great reaction, but if it had been your son or your daughter or your personal friend who died in that landslide, there would be a different reaction. I've noticed, uh, secondly, that, that the older a person is, it doesn't necessarily make the news of death uh, uh, any easier necessarily, but it's more understandable and more acceptable, and, and the older a person is, the less the reaction has to be. I've noticed that. Have you noticed that too? That if a person who's 89 years old, has lived a good life, loves Jesus, it's kind of like it's not as, it doesn't cause as much a reaction as someone's 12 years old and been diagnosed with leukemia and given one year to live. That tends to be a, a type of reactionary thing. I've noticed that at times that uh, the way a person dies, if it's a violent death, uh, if it was a, a, an unjust death, Jesus is death was unjust uh, and it quite I mean speaking on behalf of Peter he may have been reacting to that when Jesus said he's going to be you know, mocked and spit on and he's going to be beaten and ultimately be crucified uh, he may have reacted to the violentness because there tends to be in our society when someone is violently killed uh, it's different, different than just a death if, per se there's even a uh, psychologically, and Roger could probably address this better than I could, but even when uh, psychologists say that when you go through a death or the news of a death, there's, there's a certain pathway that you take. First of all, if I went to the doctors and uh, I was told that I had one month to live, uh, if I followed this pattern, the first thing that would happen to me is I'd be shocked. How many people are walking around today, they don't even know that something's wrong inside. I found out for the first time last week I have high blood pressure. Now, that, that, to me, that's not a major thing, but, but it seems to be important to the doctor, so, so she wants to check a, a couple more times, but I've never had high blood pressure. I've known I had high cholesterol for a long time, over 300, so I finally started taking some medicine for that. But it's kind of like, you know, how many people are walking around, you don't feel anything with your high blood pressure, but there's, they don't, you don't know that there's an aneurysm in your head, but you're going to die this week. You don't know that. See, this, is, this isn't a fun topic, is it, to talk about? But, but the reality is, point number one, everybody's going to die. And some of us will know, but some of us won't know. And so when you share that, what type of reaction does that cause? So if I were to go into the hospital, they told me I had one month to live, I'd be shocked, first of all. Second thing the psychologist says is you'll start to deny it. Then after you deny it, I think you get angry. Then after you get angry, I, I'm told if I'm, if I'm online uh, with my thoughts is that, that uh, you'll begin to bargain. I become a Christian at that point. 
I say that even an atheist will pray to God when he's going down in an airplane. You know, I'm all God. You know what I mean? If I'll do this, I will change my life. I'll stop doing that. All these bargaining mechanisms start coming up. Then after the bargaining, there's a depression stage. That can really linger in all the stages, I would assume, but at least there's a depression stage that takes place. Then after depression, finally there's an acceptance if everything goes well. The last step down is accepting, embracing what is. See, that's what, what I want to do. I want to embrace death. I want to embrace the death of Christ. In this season, this 21-day fast, as I pray, I say, oh, God, help me to get close to your death. See, Paul says if you're going to experience the power of his resurrection, you've got to be acquainted with the sufferings that he went through. I want to know what it's like to, 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 for what you went through. I want to embrace that. That's called acceptance. And it's the last step down, but it's the first step up to this last stage, which is called hope. There's hope. And for some, barring a miracle from God, death will take place, but there's still hope. The hope is that God has prepared a place for us so that death isn't the last step. It's actually the first step into eternity. And you've heard me say today, for a Christian, boy, when you die, it'll be the best day of your life. The worst day probably for our lives, but the best day for your life because instantly you're in the presence of the living God. So Peter reacts to this uh, vehemently and he uh, uh, goes through whatever process he went through and he uh, says what he says and Jesus comes back with, with this uh, statement. He said, get behind me, Satan, you... You look at things from man's vantage point, with man's interest. You're not really concerned with God's vantage point, God's perspective, the divine perspective. You're not interested in what he's interested in. You're interested in holding on to what you have. You don't want to lose your relationship with me. You want to hold on to it. Now, I want to talk for a few moments about a human perspective and a divine perspective. Because Peter was functioning with a human perspective, and that's what Jesus addresses. It's so strong. Not, he's not saying, Peter, you are Satan. He's saying the same source that inspired Satan to tempt me in the wilderness, saying, you, aren't, you shouldn't hurt. Make those stones into bread. Take care of yourself. And you don't have to suffer. If you'll just bow down to me, I'll give you the whole world. You see, it's the same source. That which came from the enemy was now coming to Jesus through Peter. So he says, get behind me. You need to start following me again. Get behind me and follow me. Why do you do this? You look with a human perspective. HP, human perspective, rather than a divine perspective. A human perspective, let me just talk with you, give you a couple of pointers about a human perspective. The human perspective is led by our senses, our senses, uh, sight, sound, touch, taste, smell, our five senses. First Corinthians chapter 2, it talks about the natural man not being able to perceive spiritual things. And in that context, he's talking about the person who's not been regenerated, person who's not saved, never embraced Jesus as their Savior, never become a Christian, a Christ follower, and a person who's never done that is unable to understand and perceive spiritual stuff. But he's not just talking about the unregenerated, he's talking about the, even at times, the regenerated person who's like a baby, you, you haven't been able to eat meat, you're still drinking milk because you look at things from a human's perspective. You live your life on the basis of your senses. And when you do that, you miss God. That's what Peter did. If it looks good, I buy it. If it smells good, I enjoy it. If it tastes good, I eat it. If it sounds good, I believe it. You see, they're all the senses, and that's the way I live my life. A second thing about uh, this human perspective, is that it's very, very short-sighted. And it's always self-centered. Jesus says, you're making this reaction because basically you're interested in what you're interested in. You're self-centered. You're short-sighted. 
when you come to a crisis and you go to the doctors and he says, you've got one month to live, what do we do? We react by saying, let's call the prayer teams. Let's get the anointing oil. Though we stand against it. You're not going to die. God's going to heal you. And see, I'm not against, heal, uh, against healing. I believe in healing. I'm not against prayer. I believe in prayer. But shouldn't we, first of all, before we react to news like that, say, God, what do you have in mind here? I love what June Evans said, and there's 85 women uh, at the, the retreat this morning. By the way, men, if you're here and your wife is at the retreat and you took time to uh, uh, dress your kids and get them here, Andrew, who stood up and did the announcements, he has four kids. He emailed me last night and says, hey, would it be okay if I was just a little bit late? Didn't come in at 7.30 because we usually get here about 7.30. I, I get, get here earlier than that. Some of the others do as well, but at least 7.30. He says, could I come in about 8.15? I wrote back, says, come at 9 o'clock. Just be there for the time of the transition. That's okay with me, 9, 9.20. Uh, all of you who have taken care of your kids and you find yourself here today with your wife's gone, I commend you. Would you I'd just like to commend all. I don't know who you are, but, but uh, I'm glad, you, glad you're here today. I have absolutely no idea why I shared that. <laughs> I, guess I, was, I, I guess I was talking about uh, self-centeredness and the decisions that we make are all based upon my, my convenience. See, it's a lot easier when your wife's away at, at a conference uh, and you've got two or three kids that you have to get ready and they're all small. It's easier just to say, you know, I think I'll stay home today. That, see, you make decisions that, that follow the path of least resistance, and that's what human perspective does. It'll always cause you to make a decision that's best for you. You'll never vote for something that's best for everyone. It's ha you have yourself in mind. When you get a group picture and you're in it, who do you look for first? You, you, don't, you don't really care about what the picture looks like as long as you look good. Uh, that's fine with me. i got my eyes open. i got a big smile. I think that's a good one. It's like we're interested in ourselves. We're very, very short-sighted. You know, people who live life with their senses and on the basis of a human perspective are people who, who uh, are very, very short-sighted. They react to what's going on, so they're reactionary as a general rule. And they, they don't stop to say, what are you wanting to teach me, Lord, in the midst of this? I've just been diagnosed with this. This traumatic thing has just happened. Instead of trying to get rid of it instantly by the power of faith and all charismatics want to change everything, God's saying, is there anything you can accept you know, that's on the negative side. See, if you're a human perspective approaching per type of per person, you'll just conclude that all negative stuff is all evil. See, and everything that's negative in your and my life is not necessarily evil. Some of the negative things in life God's using to develop you and deepen you and make you grow up in Jesus Christ. And if we're always reacting to what God, God is doing, those difficult, dark, death times experiences, we miss God in the midst of those things. And we're waiting to get out of the tunnel so that we can see God. And God says, I want you to see me in the midst of your tunnel. My presence is everywhere. I'm in the dark. I'm in the difficult times. I can see everything. I'm with you. I'll take you through this, but open your eyes. Don't re be reactive. Start to see me. This human perspective tends to worry a whole lot and is filled with anxiety because, see, my focus is on me and I don't know about tomorrow, so therefore it keeps me in a state of worry and concern. And so what do I do? I try to hold on to things. I try to control things. I don't, know if, I don't know what's going to happen on my job down the road, so, so I hold on to my money. I don't give to God. I don't, I don't contribute to, to what he's doing. I hold on to my time because I don't know. Boy, boy I've been diagnosed with, with uh, one month to live, so therefore I'm going to quit everything. I'm going to go to the mountains and retreat and re relax. Jesus didn't have to change a thing. He was already walking in the will of God. This divine perspective. Oh, don't, don't, you, don't you want that? How do you get a divine perspective? I, I, I don't have all the answers <coughs> to that, but I, I do know that I've, I've personally done a couple of things. I try never to forget, number one, I try never to forget that my fallen nature, my human self, will, na will naturally always live life on the human perspective level. Isaiah says, your ways are not my ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I want to keep aware of that. I, want to, I don't want to lose sight of that so that I'll continue to secondly call out to him and say, Father, give me the spirit of revelation. See, Peter had just experienced a revelation. Jesus asked him right at Caesarea Philippi, who do men say that I am? And they 
told him, well, who do you say that I am? You're the son of God. Uh, Jesus said, man didn't reveal that to you. You didn't get that through study. That was a revel revelation of the living God. So I'm aware of my fallenness. I am aware that I approach life with my senses. They, they almost drive me at times. How many people are driven by their emotions? It seems as though our nation is so emotionally led. One thing that's is said can topple everything because of it. we're emotionally led, we're mental led. But God says, I want you to be spirit led believers. <coughs> and so I pray, oh God, let the spirit of revelation be upon me. I thirdly, I try to keep my eyes open. I look ahead. When my dad taught me how to drive, he, he said, now keep your eyes, and he shouldn't have done this, but uh, I used to sit on his lap. Then as I got older, I, I, I mean, I started learning to drive about six years old on the, on the ranch. Well, when I say ranch, that sounds pretty nice, but it was actually an old farmhouse with a lot of property and because uh, uh, we were very poor. But he'd let, let me sit on the tractor, and that's where I first started to drive. Then I'd sit by him uh, as I got older, and he used to say, keep your eyes, because I would look down like this. He says, no, you've got to look ahead. Well, no, I've got to look down. No, you've got to look ahead. you got to keep. So the further you can look ahead, he looked beyond your deeds and he saw your needs. I read that someplace, somewhere, some time ago. He looked beyond my activities, my, my, what, what I was doing, and he loved me anyway. I look beyond something. I've got to look beyond what's happening to me and say, God, first of all, before I react, is there something you want me to learn in the midst of this? I know you're going to deliver me one way or the other. I'm going to get through this. I've gone through a lot of traumas in my life. So have you. But God's gotten me through every one of them. And he will get me through every other one that I face until the time comes for me to go home. And there will be a time when I go home and you go home. Because as we said in point number one, everybody dies. How do I get a divine perspective? You've got to be aware of the fact that you're fallen. You've got to call out to God because you are a person who says, I want to uh, have a divine perspective. You've got to keep looking ahead. You've got to repent for a demanding spirit. I don't know what Peter did after that rebuke from Jesus. And I want you to notice that Peter's was a reaction, but Jesus's was a response. Get behind me, Satan. Now, I don't know what, it doesn't tell us what Peter did at that point, but just knowing Peter, I'll bet that after he got done talking to the disciples, oh, forgive me, God, forgive me, please, I didn't know what I was talking about. He repented from that demanding, controlling spirit. If there's any spirit that controls people this day, I would say it's a demanding spirit. I tell you what to do. For me, I see it so oftentimes. Instead of this spirit of surrender, and that's really what death is on the spiritual side, it's surrender. I reach a point where I say, God, not my will, but yours be done. When I reach that point, I've died. I've died. And you know, it's at that point that God can come through and begin to minister to you. He's waiting for you to come to an end of yourself. He's waiting me to come, for me to come to an end of myself, to die to myself. And as I die to myself, all of a sudden, his life can happen in me. But he can't release life to me while I'm still controlling things. You see, that's why he was so strong in his rebuke. Peter, you don't understand. You're missing life because you're trying to control things. You're trying to make life into what you want it to be instead of embracing what I've created it to be. My marriage was hell on earth for the first 10 years because I was trying to make my wife what I wanted her to be. Instead of saying, God, who have you created her to be? Let me discover who this woman is. And 37 years later, I can say, I don't love her because she's a good mom, even though she is. She's a great cook, even, but I don't love her for that reason, even though she is a great cook. I love her because of who she is. God gave her to me. I don't try to make her into something. I embrace who she is to me. Does that make sense? So Jesus comes back with a strong response and to let Peter know that you don't understand, you're missing God. But more importantly than that, he missed the core belief and truth about Christianity. He missed the central message of the Bible. He missed the pivotal point in history. See, point number three, I think it's, it's actually the second section in your notes. 
the, 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 it, it says that, that you are, in fact, and I will tend to react to things if we have a human perspective and exclude the divine. We'll, we'll tend to react to news about life and death, difficulty, with a human perspective, and if we exclude the divine. But after Jesus responds, he responds, and he does so, so strongly because, and your third point says in your notes, says Jesus did not come to ultimately, and the word is live among us for a season, but to die for us so that we might live with him for eternity. See, that was the real bottom line. The core principle and truth of Scripture is Jesus didn't come to live. He came to die. And if we don't embrace that, we will miss the power of God in this season and the life that God has to offer us. My prayer is this. And I encourage you on the days that you fast and pray, I pray that God would open your eyes and help you to embrace and see the value that you have in his eyes through the death that he allowed to happen to his son for you because he didn't come to live among us as much as he came to die for us so that we could live him with him. Next week I want to talk to you about the way that God died, the cross. I plan on watching the, the movie that I've watched a couple of times now. Uh, I haven't done it every year since it came out, called The Passion. It's a very graphic movie, but I will be watching that this next week to remind myself of the way Christ died. I want to talk to you about why Christ had to die next week. I want to talk to you about the depth of our sin. There's five different Greek words that are used for sin. I want to explore those with you next week. But for right now, I want us to pray and fast for the next 14 days, for those of you just beginning, and ask God to open up a heart to understand the cross. But in my conclusion now, I want to look at the next verses because Jesus now draws a personal application to this, a practical application for this. He goes on and he says, he says verse 24, he turns to his disciples. Now, ask after, after now, he's talked to his disciples about death. Peter has reacted the way he's reacted. Jesus has responded to him. And now, after that, he turns to his disciples. He says, now listen. It's as if he's saying, now, I, I, want, I want you to understand something about death. He said, he said, if anyone would come after me, if you're going to really be a follower of Christ, you've got to deny yourself. Now, he's not talking about putting yourself down, considering yourself a worm. He's not saying that you, you, you are no good. The self is terrible. He's talking about you, you've got to get the self off the throne. You're not ruling. You're, you're, you're not calling the shots. It, everything doesn't go through your, your office. It's not passed by your desk. He said, you've got to he, understand that following me is going to require that times you'll have to say no to yourself. It's called, there's a fruit of the Spirit called self-control. It doesn't mean that your self is under control because you count to ten and you don't explode. It means the, actually inner Lord that yourself has been brought under control because you've surrendered to the living God and he is now ruling in your life and the decisions that you make are not for your benefit but for his benefit. So therefore yourself comes under control. So you have to deny yourself. You've got a, you've got a cross to bear. I'm not the only one who's going to die. You've got a cross that you have to bear and you've got to go wherever I tell you. So if you're going to call yourself a Christian, and he's talking to the disciples now, and he's, and, and he's talking to us. And he says, listen, you have to know that there is a cross that you're going to have to go through as well. And he goes on, he says, if you want to live, you've got to lose your life. But if you lose your life, you'll actually not lose it. I'll give it back to you. Why does he talk about losing your life? See, that's in verse 25. He said, uh, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. See, death is about losing something. See, it's broader than just dying physically. The birth and death cycle happens throughout our lifetime. 
And if you and I don't learn how to give birth to something and then at some point in our life to let it go, to, to release it, you'll find that you will rob yourself of that life that God can give because he now expands it for the disciples. Hey, this is more than just dying on the cross. It's also about the lifestyle that you will have. There's going to be death that you will experience. And this is where I felt practically the Lord spoke a word to my heart. He said that some people will be here today and so I'm just going to just share it with you. Some of you are facing a loss of a job. And God said, says, don't react to that. Ask me what I have in store. You've lost something. And if you react to it as Peter reacted to my news, you're going to miss my plan that I have for you. Some could be facing a transfer of job. And your job, and we have a couple of families who had to move out of town. They didn't want to leave the church. They didn't want to leave the town. They didn't want to leave their, lose their friends and leave their friends. But they had to because they have to provide for their family. So they had, to, they had to leave. Some of the military families have to transfer periodically. And sometimes you lose your friends. You lose something. And if you react to that, all of a sudden you miss what God is wanting to do. Some will lose your children. They'll leave home someday. Now, that's good news <laughs> to many of us. And that's the way it should be. But how many of you, when it really happened, it was kind of tough? It was difficult. Now, it wasn't really that difficult for us, personally. But sometimes it's difficult. Just like when you drop that little, little uh, five-year-old off at school for the first day. You know, and they're... They're just, they're wanting to go, but you're just crying. You're afraid and you're fearful and you're letting them go. Some of you are shaking your head saying, no, that wasn't me. I was glad, glad to get rid of them. And that could be true. Well, what about when your kids are older and they do leave home and you're okay with that, but they come and say, hey, by the way, I've got a job and it's, uh, by the way, it's in Japan. I'm going to have to move from, from, from you, mom and dad, and we'll be about three or 4,000 miles away. See, see, all of a sudden we tend to, no, 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 hey, let's, let's try to find a job here. No, this is, and we try to hold them close to us instead of losing them. See, if you react to those types of things, all of a sudden, now, Cullen, you've had to face that. And from my talks with you, you've done it with flying cars. His daughter lives up in Canada now. And, and they, they, they've commuted, and they've, it was t wasn't it tough for you to let them go? It's, it's, it's tough to go through a loss of any type. But, but if you react, you'll miss what God has. I hope this never happens to you, but some of you live in a nice home, three bedrooms, two bath, five bedrooms, six bath, I don't know, whatever you have. But if the economy hits you and you have to go to a one bedroom, one bath apartment, that will never happen. That couldn't be God. See, we react to loss. And when you react to loss, you're blinded to the divine plan. I thank God that I have the privilege of living in a house. And I'm glad that I'm there. But I'm not guaranteed that I'll always have a house. I'm guaranteed that God will always provide my food. He'll give me some place to stay. I might have to move with my boys. Wouldn't that be a kicker? Good, you're not coming back home. I'm coming to your home. That'd be the great thing. There is a God. He's going to pay you back right now. <laughs> loss. Loss. It's hard to deal with, but if you look at it with a divine perspective, God can release his life to carry you through. I love a uh, scripture that came to me as I was preparing for the funeral of uh, Mikey Dela Cruz a few weeks ago. By the way, the Dela Cruz are very appreciative of all that uh, all of you did who are participants of that. <clears throat> but as I was preparing for that funeral that took place a, a few weeks ago, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 came to me. And that very first phrase says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now, 
it makes even more sense when you understand that King Uzziah was a personal friend of Isaiah. In the year that my personal friend died. See, sometimes people will lose a wife, lose a husband, lose a son, lose a personal friend, and they get bitter against God. They don't run to God, but they run away from God. They'll interpret things from a human perspective, and they'll miss God altogether. And that's why it's so impressive that Isaiah says, in the season that my friend died, I saw the Lord. In the midst of death, in the midst of Christ's death, we can only see pain, only see agony, the lashes on the back, the tribulation he went through. How dare you spit on him? I dare you treat Jesus like that. You, you can begin to see that and you can miss the glory of God. I love that. I can't do it as well as that guy. He says, Friday's here, but Sunday's coming. When you lose sight, it, it's, it's easy in the midst of darkness to lose sight of the Lord. But when he says, I saw the Lord when my friend died, it's saying, I had a divine perspective. It's, it's, it's possible to see things through God's eyes. Just because his ways aren't your ways, his thoughts aren't your thoughts, they can be. You can learn them, you can grow them. Familiarize yourself with his word. Be in the word on a day, but eat from his word. You'll, you'll develop a divine perspective of life. If the doctor comes and he gives you one month to live, I saw the Lord. If the Lord... If my home is lost and I, and I have to live in an apartment, I saw the Lord. If my son moves away and I only talk to him twice a year instead of every day, I see the Lord. Oh, that's what he's talking to Peter about. It's what he's telling the disciple. Listen, it's not about this life. It's not about you. There's something grand that's coming up. Boy, I, I, I started to weep. I, I probably, if I were here by myself, maybe I just should let myself go, but I, I could have just exploded in tears. I don't know what it was, but when he started to sing that imagine song, I can only imagine there is, a, 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 there is an eternity prepared for us, and we're holding on to little things in life, not realizing how much there is ahead. Our God is coming back, and we got a, we got a future with him. We don't have to hold on to things. I'll tell you, this seven-day fast, is, my eyes have been open to, boy, God, I'm, I want to be free. By the end of these 21 days, I want to be free of holding on to anything. I don't want to react to stuff. I want you to show me what you're doing because you're up to something regardless of what I'm going through. So when my friend died, when bad news comes, you only got a month to live, I can see the Lord. And I like what June Evans said while back because I've always believed it. I don't pray for anything until I hear God. I want to hear God. When Peter said, the Lord has revealed to me that my time is imminent, my death is imminent, Second Peter 1, he's saying that God told me I'm going to die. He could have prayed all he wanted to. He could have had 10 elders a day visit his home. He could have had anointing oil and he was still going to die because he heard the Lord. That's why it's important before you react to whatever and do whatever and not that I'm once again I want to cover myself I'm not suggesting we don't pray for those things I believe in all of those things but let's first of all before we react say God what are you saying hear his voice and then we stand no this death and he said this didn't he too was it Hezekiah I forget the guy's name just comes to me now he said oh, there was a guy who was going to die he says would you give me a few years later he says this, this is an unto death in the New Testament, he did a healing. This is, this is an unto death. This is going to take place. This, this is, he's going to heal. There are those times where he speaks the word. And then on the basis of that word, you begin to stand in faith. And that's what takes place. His word is fulfilled. Let's stand uh, today as we conclude. The reality in life is one of the unchanging facts of life is that everyone dies. The challenge for you and me is to live today as if it were our last day on earth so that we wouldn't have to change anything. I'm already living the way God wants me to. 
You tend to overreact when you only see th from a human perspective and you exclude the divine. And last of all, Jesus did not come to ultimately live among us for a season, but to die for us so that we might live with him for eternity. That's what we covered today in this text. And the practical application is beyond now the death of Christ and death happens to all of us in all areas. And I hear him saying, stop reacting and start seeing my grace. With your eyes closed or open, doesn't matter to me. If you are in the midst of a death process, and I don't, maybe it's a death to a relationship, maybe it's a death to a, you, you've lost something. I just want you to lift both hands up, like this. Yeah. Okay. And I want you to open your fingers, just just like I. If, you, if you're looking, you're just looking. You, you've you're in the midst of a, of a of a death experience. God, for the number of people who have their hands up, and I encourage you to just keep them up. Okay. Uh, don't even regard what anybody else might think. Uh, it's not a humiliating factor. My hands are up as well because I'm going through a death experience. I pray, God, that our, as our hands are up, you would bring alongside an Aaron and a Hur, someone that two men who held up Moses' arms. I pray that you would uh, cause us to fellowship with those that can help us keep our fingerprints off things, Lord. We want to live our lives from this point on with our hands raised, our palms open to you so that we're not clutching or trying to control things. It's a stance of surrender. And I pray that even as we choose today to lose our lives, we also receive that promise that says we will actually find life that is so much better for us. I pray, oh God, for those whose hands are raised, that you'll strengthen them. You'll encourage them through this difficult time. That you will help them to move from a human perspective. And there's nothing evil in seeing things humanly, but, but when it blinds the divine perspective, then it gets in your way. So I pray that you'd open their eyes to see from a divine vantage point what they're going through so that they would experience all that you have for them and not miss the core truth of Christianity that Peter missed until Jesus explained it to him. I pray these things in Jesus' name. And last of all, with your hands down, and your, just take the hand of a person beside you. You don't need to bridge the aisles, but if you're close enough to someone, just take their hand. Now together, Lord, as we dismiss today, I just pray that this week and the week following, leading up to Easter, that you would make yourself alive to us, that we would as we fast and pray together and seek your face for those three areas that are listed on the back of that insert, we'd see healings, we'd see salvations, we'd see deliverances take place. I pray, oh God, that you'd make us aware and sensitive again, refreshed to the true meaning of the cross, what you went through, dealing with our sins, and cause us to celebrate. As you've already told me that you would be there on Easter Sunday morning, I'm looking for an outpouring of your spirit. Don't know what that'll look like. Don't know what that'll feel like. I know it's not because we have something special, special planned, Lord. It's, just, it's another day in your presence. But somehow I know that you're going to help us celebrate that day, your resurrection. But as we lead up to it, may we not forget the cross. On our Good Friday service, I pray that you'd even go there and begin to, to touch and make arrangements so that, so that we could experience the reality of your cross, even as you've begun to do today. And we pray these things all, and would you say in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You know, there's going to be some elders and prayer teams, and elders and prayer teams, if you'd make your way down here. If you uh, have something you'd like to have us agree with you in prayer for, please come down. If you have not met Jesus Christ as your personal Savior today, we would love to introduce him to you. Please come down and let us do that as well, and we'll give you some material. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.